ahead and get us started here. My name is Jason Lachlan. I'm the department chair of biology here at Temple College. I'm excited to be here to talk to you a little bit about undergraduate research opportunities that we have here and um, maybe more importantly the challenges that come along with those. Uh, research, especially undergraduate research, is very exciting for students. Um, it can be exciting for faculty, uh, but there are those challenges that we do need to uh, sort of if you go into a, into a project or into a program, it's always nice to know what challenges there are so that we can help to over overcome those. Uh, all right, so let's go ahead and, and get started. I want to basically split this talk up about, about an hour or so um, into two sections. I want to talk about why undergraduate research first, and, um, and then we'll talk about the opportunities. And, and when I say opportunities, I'm going to be talking about some of the projects that I've done over the last several years with students just to give you guys an idea of what's possible um, because those opportunities are tied with some challenges. So we'll talk about some of those projects and highlight some of the students that, um, that I've worked with uh, over the past 10 years. I actually driving in this morning thinking about how long this has been going on. So this year is about 10 years uh, and I've, I think this is a handful of them. There are a few more that I need photos of, but we'll highlight some of those, uh, some of their projects as we go along this this talk. So first let me, let me sort of set the stage with the problem. The problem with biology education and then why should we pursue research opportunities. So one of the big problems, and, and many of you in biology classes now know, that biology as a whole is a very content rich area. And that content is increasing every single year exponentially because of all of the research that it is spitting out. So one of the big challenges is how do we go about educating students that are coming into the system? Um, what do we teach with all of the content that's there? Um, sometimes we just want to include more and more and more and more and it becomes overwhelming and pointless. So how do we, how do we handle that? Much of this research, much of the research explosion really I think came from the discovery of DNA and the DNA structure from Watson and Crick. Um, with that came a huge explosion of, 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 of information from the 1960s and since. If you look at the number of biomedical papers, so this is just biomedical articles that are coming out annually. Over here on that y-axis is um, the number in thousands. So down here is here. This is a little dated. This only goes back to 2010. But in 1960, for example, we were, we were producing about 100,000 articles a year just in biomedical science. Jump ahead to 2010, we were um, approaching a million. Certainly by now we're well past that. And so you can see that there's a lot of information coming out. Um, it also means as an educator or a researcher, you're reading about 10 times more today than you did just 20 years ago. And that's just to keep up. Okay. So how do we do this, right? How do we approach this? So in 2003, actually, 2003, there was an initiative put out by the National Research Council. It was called Bio 2010. And this initiative was there to sort of set the stage for rethinking how we educate biology students. Um, how, how, do we, how do we deal with this content that keeps coming out and keeps inundating us with information? And so this initiative really redirected or refocused our emphasis on methodology and critical thinking and, that's, and, and kind of pulled back a little bit on the content. And so with that, of course, undergraduate research opportunities were part of this initiative because, as, you, as you'll see, methodology is huge, critical thinking is maybe even bigger with how we do these projects. Um, so that was certainly part of the initiative. And many, uh, many four-year schools jumped right in for undergraduate research. Community college, uh, community college institutions have been a little bit more reluctant for some reasons I'll talk about here in just a second. <coughs> but um, the, undergraduate, or the, the research council did define undergraduate research, and I, I wanted to put this up here because I want to, at the very front here, talk about what it is and what it is not. So it says here that uh, it's an inquiry or investigation conducted by an undergraduate in collaboration with faculty mentor that makes an original intellectual or creative contribution to the discipline. And that's, that last part's really key because I'm not trying to get students in there to do science fair projects. I'm not trying to get students in there where I already know the answers to the questions that we're asking. We are doing research that's 
that's adding to the discipline. Okay, so there's a big difference. Science fairs have their place, um, but when we talk about undergraduate research, we're not going to waste time with things that we already know the answers to. We are promoting the discipline. We're trying to add content in a meaningful way. Okay, so that's, that's key. There are a lot of different kinds of programs. Um, Four-year schools especially have a lot of these National Science Foundation uh, supported programs. They all basically have uh, undergraduate research in them and there's slight subtle differences between all of them. But overall what this really documents is that it is well supported. Undergraduate research experiences are well supported and they are, or at least have been prior to 2010, they have been well funded. Um, National Science Foundation, is, as, as everything else is getting cut, but uh, we can still take some opportunities and, and there is still some money available. <coughs> so, let's talk about benefits. Let's talk about the good stuff first. Uh, here we are, this is a science club actually, 2012. We went to Sol Ross University out in Alpine. Actually, Dr. Lyles is here uh, today. Uh, went out with us on that trip, uh, as I remember. Um, but here we are getting ready for the annual banquet, banquet at the Texas Academy of Science meeting. I think Reagan, were you on that trip? No. Next one, okay. Uh, so we're, we're getting ready for the annual banquet, um, specifically the award ceremony that night. But let's talk about some benefits. <clears throat> so one thing is that students, from a student's perspective, you get to learn about the issues, the methods, and in some cases you either get to work with or you get to meet leaders in the field. Okay, sometimes world-renowned experts in something that you may be very interested in. Uh, you get to apply those concepts from the courses that, uh, that you sometimes may struggle to make connections with, like calculus or basic algebra, like why do I need to know these kinds of things to function in the real world? And if you're in a research lab, the real world is that research lab. And so you get to apply those concepts, you can understand why those, why those concepts that we're drilling in, in the lecture classes, why those really uh, become very important here. Uh, promoting your creative achievements, of course, that's, that's, that's great. You get to go perhaps present your data, present your research to conferences or, or perhaps even publication. Sharpening your problem solving skills. Uh, big one is exploring your potential careers. And I'll talk a little bit more about that in a second. But if you're at all remotely interested or think you might be interested in some kind of research, now's the time to find out. So I'll show you some slides in a second. But Basically, if you get in now and you decide, this is not for me, I hate it, it's a great time to pivot away from that and do something different. It's a lot easier to pivot away from it now than it would be after your graduate degrees, when you're sort of committed at that point. So potential careers, if you're at all interested, you think you might be interested, undergraduate research is a great place to figure out, is it for me? Uh, you get to enhance those professional communication skills, again, through either conferences or uh, through manuscripts and publications, preparing for graduate school and, and professional school. I know many med schools now are looking for students that have research experience um, as part of the package. And then networking with others who share your interest, okay, whether it be a really, really small interest in fungi or whatever it is that you're interested in. You get to meet people at conferences and you get to work with them. <coughs> Here's a group of us, um, I think this was at Texas A&M Galveston. We have some physics students over here uh, presented their work. We've got a couple biology students there. We have Ms. Armstrong, Dr. Hill, Dr. Salazar, and then off to the left here is Dr. McLean in physics. So we've got really a lot of science areas represented at this, at this particular conference, uh, which we go to every year in Science Club. Um, by the way, speaking of world-renowned experts, this guy back here is George Perry. Um, he is a world-renowned expert in Alzheimer's disease. Um, and so our students, there's one right behind this table, actually. All right, so uh, additional student benefits. This is Woody, by the way. He's a physics person, uh, physics student, was a physics student, presenting a, a paper there, a poster. Uh, also, you get to grow as a critical, independent thinker. We're always harping on that in terms of education, uh, enhancing your ability to learn independently, enhancing the awareness of ethical issues that you may or may not be aware of, of course, at this point, gaining knowledge and skills, obvious, right? Pick up some lab skills, pick up some field work. Increasing confidence, this is big. I'll never forget my very first student, uh, Dave Cummings, um, who came into my general biology class with very little con uh, confidence. He was extremely intimidated by the whole process. 
um, and I, just a few years ago graduated. He's a medical, he's a, he's a doctor now. Um, went to med school at UP, UT El Paso. Um, but I, once he sort of started doing some research, like he just became confident and everything that he did past that was, was rather successful. So that was a great experience uh, for me. So what about faculty? Why should faculty be involved? Why should, we, why should we do something extra, one extra thing that we have to do? Why should we pursue students to participate with research? One is we get, to, we get to mentor, we get to work with quality students, we get to work with the engaged students, and we're always looking for those students. Always. So that's, a, that's, that's, that's key for me. Uh, you, of course, get to influence the career of those students, break down barriers between student and faculty. Um, I know that I've heard that I'm sometimes intimidating. People don't approach me outside of class because I'm intimidating. So there's a barrier that exists, right? So, but when we get out in the field and we're working in the field, we're working in the lab, that barrier comes down a little bit. So we get to break down those. Uh, directly integrate scholarship and teaching. So what we're learning in the lab, we can apply that to our teaching. So that's fantastic. For me, remaining current in my discipline is great. So I'm still reading literature in my field of, that I was trained in. Um, I'm still asking questions based on what I'm reading. So I'm still advancing. I'm, not, I'm just not becoming stagnant. And then renewing our enthusiasm for working with you guys. So believe it or not, that enthusiasm tends to wear a little bit. Um, we come out brand new, everything's great, we're really enthused, but through time, as with everything else, through time that, that enthusiasm wears a little bit. But when we get back into a lab situation, we're working with you one-on-one, -on -one, we're asking questions, we're getting data that we've never seen before, we're trying to interpret that with you, all of that and you being engaged, of course, is very uh, motivating and, and it re renew renews that enthusiasm for working with you guys. So that's great. Faculty benefit, students benefit. There's got to be an institutional benefit too. Because if the institution doesn't support it, it's dead. Nothing, nothing's going to happen. And why should an institution, why should Temple College support undergraduate research at this point? Because if you think about it from, a, from an institutional standpoint, we're shifting focus from educating masses of students, like in big sections, where a faculty is teaching 48, 60 students, to a situation where a faculty member is working with one or two students for maybe four or five years. So why should an institution support that? It doesn't make sense, right? Well, when we look at what it actually does for the institution, one is, is it builds a community of scholars. When you have biology students, let's say some of you guys are working in biology, you're doing a project, many times that's going to that's gonna be an interdisciplinary project. So we're going to be working perhaps with chemistry, as we've done. We may be working with physics. You may be working with the music department. Um, there's all kinds of interdisciplinary um, interactions that take place, and building a community of scholars is one big institutional benefit. It sort of, it sort of increases the vibrancy of scholarship on campus. Um, it also deepens the relationship with alumni. So those alumni that had undergraduate research experiences at some point, what they have reported is that they experience higher gains in their education, which consequently leads to more involvement, which promotes and raises the institution's visibility. Okay, so we like to have happy alumni, and what we tend to see is that if they've had an undergraduate research experience, particularly a successful one, that's going to you know, that's going to weigh in on the on the institution very well. Enriching the curriculum, we're not just teaching classes here. So enriching curriculum, we have a really d uh, deep curriculum. We have some classes, of course, that are standard things, but we also have some, some research that's taking place. Um, institutions like to see that. Student success, another really big institutional benefit here. Believe it or not, the state of Texas is now funding uh, institutions of higher education, not only by how many we have, how many students we have, but how well you guys do. So part of our funding is how well you're doing. And how well you're doing means not only how well you're doing in your classes here, but do you get an associate's degree, degree, do you get a bachelor's degree, do you go on further than that? And with every step you make, TC actually benefits from that. So institutions love to have our students succeed, not only here, but past here. And so when we look at student success, there was a there was a study done with 15,000 students that did um, undergraduate research experiences, and 88% of them said that they had a better understanding of science. 
That's huge. That's, that's, that's something that they didn't get in the classroom. They got it through research. 83% increased their confidence in their skills. 73% were more aware of what grad school is like. That's fantastic. You don't want to learn once you get there. If you have an idea about before you even apply, that's good. And then those that did an undergraduate research uh, experience had uh, a much better success, or at least a twice as likely to earn a PhD later on the, down the road. Within the STEM areas, if you look at the STEM areas and you ask those 15,000 students, about their interest in STEM after the fact. So the blue here represents about 68% of those that were surveyed that had experiences said that they have an increased interest in STEM related fields. That's great. 68% increased their interest uh, after the fact. Only 24% said they didn't have any change. All right, so that's fine. But look at this, 8% of them actually decreased their interest. And while you may think that that's bad, that's not bad, right? That's sort of this point to where we get to pivot away. If we don't like something early on, it's much better to make a tr transition at that point than going down a path which it's hard to come, sometimes get out of. So uh, interest um, in these undergraduate research experiences um, do tend to increase. All right, finally, challenges. Time constraints, both students, faculty, we all have these time constraints, especially community college students. Right? Typically, you guys are working maybe full-time, maybe you have families, you have all these other outside obligations, maybe you're taking a full load of classes. Where else can you squeeze in something else? And research experiences always take more time than you ever, ever anticipate. So time constraints, that's something to be aware of. Um, faculty tend to have an, a harder time identifying the ideal student. At four-year schools, that's not the case. For your schools, if you go in as an undergraduate and you're trying to do some undergrad research, uh, you typically don't do that till your junior or senior year. And the faculty there have had two years, maybe three, to kind of get to know you, figure out if you're going to be ideal or not. Uh, we don't have that luxury here. I mean, I'm taking in freshmen right out of high school um, into the lab, and I'm kind of rolling the dice. I'm hoping for the best, but there's really no, there's no means for me to select ideal students versus non-ideal. It's just it's just the way that we, it's just community, community college uh, life uh, is that we just don't have you here that long. Research space and equipment, another big one. We do not have the capacity. Re community colleges are not designed for research institutions to be research institutions. Um, compare that with some universities, like if you were to get hired at a university and you're going in as a researcher, it is not uncommon for that university to give you $100,000 just to get your lab set up. Okay, that's not going to happen here. And so how do we overcome that, right? So I'll show you some, some ways to get around that. Administrative support and funding, another challenge sometimes at a community college. Uh, again, going back to why should we focus on just a handful of students again? I'm not understanding this versus the big groups. I will say that since I've been doing it, TC leadership um, has never ever flinched. So they've been on board the whole time, uh, which is very fortunate. That's not the case everywhere. Uh, limited student experiences and faculty expectations. My expectations are always too elevated. I always have high expectations going into a project. Um, so that's just a problem that I have. But limited student experiences also sometimes manifest in bad ways. Uh, I had a student, I, I didn't even know this student. I got an email at the beginning of one summer. This was a couple of years ago. They were going to be applying to med school in the fall. They wanted to do a, a summer research project with me. Fine. Uh, but then they also wanted to publish that before they applied in the fall. And they wanted to publish it in Science. Now, Science is the top-notch journal. If, as, a, as a researcher, if you ever in your 35-year career get an uh, article put in Science, you're good. Like, that's, you're, you're at the top. So here's, you know, this is an unexpected, student unexpected, uh, a limited experience kind of uh, consequence of just not knowing how it works. It takes years and years and years to get a manuscript worthy enough of science. Unreal unrealistic uh, student expectations. Another challenge, biological timetables, life cycles. For biology, we're not chemistry, we're not physics. We can't necessarily plan on doing a reaction from eight to five to get data. Biology, the organisms are working on their own time scales. If you have to come up to the lab at 3 a.m., 
to measure something because that's what time is going on, that's what time you have to come up. Um, and sometimes that's a challenge for our schedules. Okay. Opportunities. So let's get to the good stuff here. So keeping in mind, we've got these challenges, right? We've got these challenges of lab space, of lab equipment, of funding, of cost. What can we do at a community college? Um, so let me show you this. This is, um, this is a little dated, but this is just a graph that shows the total number of species on the planet that have been described. So we're about at 1.5 million species described. That's probably a little low now. The total number of species that's estimated to be out there is 10 to 20 million, and that's a broad range, but it's an estimate. So we're still not even there. But let's just take the 1.5 million that we know that's out there. 750,000, more than half of them are insects. And then the rest, so insects plus other animals, makes up about a million animal species out there. About 250,000 plants, 70,000 fungi, 58,000 protists, and around 5,000 bacteria. All right. If we take the animals, which is what I tend to focus in on, the animals, and we look at this, so this is the animals, one, one million species of animals. All of these are insects, so look at the pie. Majority of the animals, of course, are insects. Uh, there's some spiders, so there's some invertebrates, there's some invertebrates right there, but then let's, let's just, we're just relatively speaking, let's look at the mammals. Mammals make up this much, about 4,000 species of mammals. And so there are people that study mammals, of course, but at our setting, where would you go if you want to ask some meaningful biological questions that you can use pretty much any model specimen that you want? We got tons of things out here, right? We have tons of opportunities that are, uh, that are available for us to get out in the field. Don't have to be in a lab situation. We can go out in the field and that can be our lab. And that's what my approach has typically been. So let's talk a little bit about those projects. Um, I'm going to talk about damselflies and dragonflies, and I want to, I want to show you a real quick difference that you can spot in the field. This is one of the specimens that we've uh, used before. Uh, this is a dragonfly, one of the smallest in Texas. It's perched here on a twig, and you can notice that the, the wings when dragonflies perch, their wings typically go horizontal. So that's one way you can tell that's a dragonfly and not a damselfly. Um, here's another one, a Halloween pennant, another big uh, popular one here but the wings are held horizontal, not vertical. They're also a little bit more robust than the damselflies. So dragonflies, I'll talk a lot about these. These have um, some, some significance uh, in my lab. Uh, here's a damselfly in contrast. So these are much more dainty, not as robust, uh, much thinner abdomen, but then their wings typically are held more vertically when they're perched like that, okay? So we've used both of these, damselflies and dragonflies. We've also, of course, been working with um, monarch butterflies and the migration, I'll talk about why, why we look at those and why we're using them. This was actually taken out here in the butterfly bed here, a couple of steps away from this room. Um, where you've got the adult there, you've got the caterpillar there. And eggs not visible here, but they're certainly on those plants. So we've got really everything going out there in the uh, butterfly bed. And then more recently, um, picked up zebra mussels. Zebra mussels, terrible that they've been introduced here in Texas, but again, usually with bad things come opportunity. So we don't like them to be in the lakes, but they do give us a great opportunity to ask some really meaningful questions because we're really on the southern edge of their distribution. Um, they're in uncharted areas, and so let's take, and see, let's take a look and see how they're doing what they're doing. So let me focus in on a couple of dragonfly damselfly topics. Let me show you what some of our students have done, what kinds of questions they've been asking. And there are three general areas where I use dragonflies and damselflies as the models to study these things. So there's this idea of fluctuating asymmetry, we'll talk about that, parasitism, and then this concept of polymorphism and the genetics behind polymorphism. So let's talk with, about fluctuating asymmetry. Uh, this is Josh Huckabee, one of the first students I had who uh, has done a, quite a bit of projects with me, but uh, Josh actually started working on fluctuating asymmetry. And what this is, everyone knows what asymmetry means. Right? Bilaterally symmetrical animals are symmetrical, usually. Right? There's some subtle asymmetry patterns that exist. So there's actually three kinds of asymmetry. If you have a right claw that's always bigger than a left claw, that is a type of asymmetry called directional asymmetry, meaning it's always that direction. Then the fluctuating asymmetry, there's no real clear direction of the asymmetry, but what is, what's thought to arise there, or why that arises, is because of uh, developmental stress. So if we're talking about 
Dragonfly larvae, when they're developing in the, in the ecosystem, if they're stressed for some reason, the idea of ace fluctuating asymmetry sometimes is the explanation for why that occurred. Offspring was, or the, the, the developing um, larva was uh, uh, stressed out, maybe too high temperature, maybe pesticides, whatever, and it comes out a little bit asymmetrical. So we'll look at that. Uh, I'll show you what, what Josh's data has uh, shown. In fact, um, he was one of our first students to submit a grant proposal to Texas Academy of Science. He got a $2,000 grant to start this project. Um, and basically what the project was is we were using Erythemus and Plisicolis. Uh, they all come out of the water. These are the adults, of course, and these are the same species. So, the, so dragonflies are sexually dimorphic. Males look different than females. They all come out of the water, though, like this. They all come out of the water green. Females will stay green, and males will then start to change into blue. So this would be a mature, sexually mature male. Um, so this was his target species. We went out in the field, we netted up a, a lot of these, and then we bring them back to the lab, and you take a scan like this. So you literally take this dragonfly, you lay it on its back, you stre stretch its, legs, uh, its, its wings out, and then you take a scan of it. And then we can go in and we can digitally measure the wing lengths to look for asymmetry in a lot of organisms, right? Or not all organisms, but a lot of uh, individuals, high sample sizes. And so what Josh found when he did this is, this is a little bit of a busy graph, but this is the proportion of dragonflies over here on the y-axis. And this is the difference, so left minus right four wing length over here. And this is just a distribution of what it looked like. Males in blue, females down here in, in red. And so at zero, this would be what? This would be perfectly symmetrical. There was no difference in the forming links of those individuals. And so what you can see there is males tended to be more symmetrical than females. Um, we also tended to see females shifting over here a little bit more towards they had more of a of longer uh, left forming links than right forming links. What that means, I don't know, but that's sort of what we started, started seeing. In addition to this big long tail over here, Females just tended to be more asymmetrical than the males. Well, that was interesting. So that's just a field observation. So then we, ended, we wanted to say, well, can we perhaps take some dragonfly larvae, stress them out, make them emerge, and let's look for some asymmetrical patterns. And so uh, here we go. We go back out in the field. Josh goes out. There's a female there that we were looking for. So we netted up a few of those. Dragonflies are really, really cooperative, too, when it comes to getting eggs out. If you get a female that has eggs, um, this is me, I'm holding a vial of lake water. I've got an Erythemus aplysicolis female here. And so when you see dragonflies flying and they're dipping down in the water, they're laying eggs. And so if you take that and you just dip the abdomen, you dip the abdomen there, uh, she'll just start releasing eggs. So it's a super fantastic way to get a lot of eggs from one individual that you know what her phenotype is, right? And so we can take these, we can rear them out in the lab. So we did. We took all these eggs, we put them in an environment, we hatched them out, so to speak. Uh, we then transport them in each individual into one of these partitioned petri dishes in the lab. Because dragonflies are ambush predators, they don't just eat dead things. So guess what? We have to go out, we have to collect living food, plankton nets. Here's Josh throwing a plankton net, collecting living things. He has to then uh, filter that out. We have to go in. He has to feed each individual one, uh, each individual uh, dragonfly larva on um, plankton until they get big enough. Once they get big enough, then you can start feeding them other things other than plankton. And so then we can start um, actually rearing some food in the lab. And so over here on the right is what a dragonfly larva looks like if you've never seen one. Um, and what we're going to do is there, we started rearing um, annelids, white worms, in the lab. And I'm dropping one down there, and as it's falling down, the dragonfly will not eat things that are not alive. It has to move for the dragonfly to be stimulated to eat it. So that's an ambush predator, because as that worm gets closer, it's going to detect it, and it will attack it quickly. And I'll slow it down one more time here. But it just sucks it down like it eats it whole. But it has a labrum, a labrum that under like a lower mandible, it reaches out and grabs onto its prey and pulls it in. Uh, and so the, the, the great thing about watching stuff like this, it never gets boring, 
But the problem is that you've got to continually feed them living things if you want to keep them alive in a lab situation. So we did that. Uh, Josh uh, had some larvae. We grew them to a certain size. And then we started trying to stress them out. We have some aquaria over here. We had some that had elevated temperatures. We had some that had, we had a chilled tank. We had some that had pest different quantities of pesticides in there to see if we could somehow stress them. And we stressed them very well. We started off with like seven or 800 larvae. Um, we stressed them all to where we had four that lived long enough to, uh, to emerge. Um, and unfortunately, that's just not a good sample size. So we did learn that's too much stress. You do have to keep them alive a little bit to hopefully get some asymmetrical patterns that come out. But that project kind of ended at that. But that was a huge effort. And sometimes that happens. Um, another student, Rodney Duckett, uh, looked at parasitism patterns in damselflies. So that guy right here, this Argeo moesta, we looked at this. And so if you take these, they ingest these oocytes that are in the environment, and these parasites um, live in the abdomen. So if I take this guy and I put it on a, on a dish under the microscope, and I cut down the ventral aspect of it and pin back the exoskeleton like this, so here's insect pins, and they're peeling back the exoskeleton, then we're revealing the GI tract, and right there, those white structures, those are the parasites. And those are unicellular parasites, by the way. They are huge. You can almost see these cells with a, without a microscope. So they're super easy to see, um, but we went in and quantified that's a very easy technique. So what Rodney wanted to do was to say, well, what kinds of uh, environmental dynamics exist to where one population might have a lot of parasites and another population may not. Same species but different different parasite loads. And so what we did is he tested this hypothesis that populations associated with running water systems, what are called lodic systems, so if you're R.G. Moesta living along these banks, the oocysts that you would typically ingest when you eat or drink are going to be in the water, and so we, we suspected that oocysts are getting washed downstream constantly, and therefore it would make the population very, it would make them very rare for them to, come, to encounter, I guess, the oocyst. And so we su suspected that in a system like this, you would find very low parasite loads in, in systems like this that are called lintic systems, where there's no flowing water, you would find more, uh, you'd find more parasitized populations. And so what he found, uh, quick quick uh, few graphs here, P he looked at the lodic prevalence. Prevalence means percent infected, percentage of the population infected. So for example, 60% of those at Nolan Creek were infected with these parasites. Uh, so here's the lodic prevalence, there's the lodic prevalence, you can see there, there's nothing really, really nothing st stood out for us, uh, no need to even do any stats. Then we looked at lodic intensity, so intensity, you can sort of think that like a parasite load, uh, the intensity is looking at the average number of parasites in the infected individuals. So if you are parasitized, you are carrying a parasite load, okay? And so that's what intensity is. It's the, it's the parasite load. And so, well, what did we find? Well, here's the lodic intensity. Look at that. Nolan Creek had a lot of parasites, relatively speaking, to the, the river channel behind Stillhouse Hollow Dam. But then over here, we have just the opposite. So nothing really stood out, um, which was fine. Kayla McCormick then came in, and she wanted to look at the same kinds of things. What could govern the differences in parasite distribution in these populations? And so she wanted to test the idea that maybe it's about population density. If you're living in a really dense population, perhaps there's more environments for the parasites to thrive in. They could get passed from one individual to the next very easily. And so that's exactly what we did. We went out. Uh, we're looking at the density of the host over here. And here are the various sites that we went to. So we just, we just laid them out from low density to high density. Highest density uh, population for, still, for the uh, damselfly was Stillhouse Hollow Lake. Um, and so we expected the prevalence or the intensity, either one, we didn't care, we expected it to follow that, that pattern. Um, and this is prevalence, parasite prevalence, so that's the percent infected, and here's intensity. Uh, we didn't really run any stats on this because our population sample sizes were pretty low. If we had to do it again, we could perhaps do it again, we just haven't, but there, whoops, there is per perhaps something going on there. We just need to probably further investigate that. She did get to present this um, at a conference, though, presented her poster. Um, let me talk quickly about this one. This one's cool, and then we might skip, I'm running out of time here. Let me skip a few things, but let me, let's do polymorphism research. This is, a, this is a Evan Gehring. He's a, he was a PhD student at UT Austin when we started this. 
Josh again is back in the picture. Uh, but Ishneria rambiria is the species that we looked at here. This is the polymorphism that I talked about a second ago. So remember, dimorphic means what? If you say a population has sexual dimorphism, it means there's two different forms, dimorphism, two different forms. There's a male form and there's a female form, right? Well, this particular species has polymorphism. So down here, this is what the species, this is what a male looks like. These are two females. And so this doesn't look like the male. That's the female that does not look like the male. That's called a gynomorph, the female form, gynomorph. This one, this is a female that looks like the male. This is called an andromorph. And these are consistently out in the environment. And so there's all kinds of ideas as to why this might occur, but we were just asking a basic question like, what's the genetic pattern of it? And then what are the consequences of that? So this was quite an involved project. Uh, again, we're rearing them out. We're feeding them like we did before. Uh, Eben would actually take known males and females that he collected, virgin males and females, and he would mate them in the lab. He would then bring them to us, the females, and we put them in this enclosure. There's a little dish right here with some water in the at the base of the cup, and it has a coffee filter in there. What damselflies will typically do, you know, earlier we talked about dragonflies, they'll, they'll, they'll fly and they'll just, they'll just lay their eggs in the water. Damselflies don't do that. Damselflies actually swim underwater and they insert their eggs into vegetation, submerged vegetation. So to mimic that, we put coffee filter in a submerged cup, put a female in here that was ready to lay some eggs, and hey, she, she cooperates very well. Here's a picture of it. There's the coffee filter. And here are all of her eggs that she just went along and just oviposited right into that filter. We didn't take that coffee filter paper out. We let it sit for a few days and they start to hatch. It can't be any easier. Uh, it works very well. We then take them, we do the same thing, we put them in their dishes, we keep track of who, which offspring belong to which parents. This is kind of Mendelian crossing, right? Sort of. Lots of work here, uh, keeping water clean, filtering it out, lots of feeding, of course. Um, here was what the lab situation looked like. Once, we, once they get big enough, you can put them in these cups, these tall cups. Each cup has a little uh, popsicle stick in it. That gives the, the, the larvae something to crawl out of um, when they're ready to emerge, like this guy right here did. Actually, she's a girl. That's a gynomorph that emerged, and then we would, you'll notice that there's uh, identification numbers written there so we know who the parent was, um, who, who was crossed with who, and we then figured out the genetics behind that. Okay? We actually also got a, pu a publication from this um, just on the method alone of how do we rear that many damselflies in a lab situation. So we did get that paper. That was out in, uh, I think, 2012. Um, gosh, I hate to skip things. It's so hard for me to skip things. Let me quickly hit the monarchs, and then I want to talk about zebra mussels. So monarchs. We know monarchs are coming through here right about this time of the year. They're actually on their tail at the end of the window. But they typically, monarch butterflies occur up here, southern Canada, northern uh, U.S., and then this time of year, they migrate right through our area into the central uh, region of Mexico, into the mountains where they overwinter. So it's a very unique generation. Makes Temple a very good spot to look at this. This is what they look like in Mexico. They just coat the trees. They sit there all winter. And these are the individuals that actually came from Canada, uh, northern U.S., where they migrated 4,000 kilometers. They overwinter in Mexico, and then in the spring, they come right back through Texas. Um, and then they start to die, so they start mating along their ways. But uh, we started this progr program with uh, tagging. So we just put tags on here. They have an ID number. People in Mexico will look for these IDs. This is how we figured out the migration pattern and where they were at certain times of the year. Um, there's another one that we released in the bed out outside. But those are the tags. That's kind of how we started. So we had, we'd go out, we do these big, these big collection events. Uh, but then George Romp here in the middle um, wanted to look a little bit further at um, wing loading. And so wing loading is a way to measure the weight of an individual, but then you also standardize it for their body size. So the units would be weight milligrams over body size or surface area for a butterfly. And I'll show you some of the things we did with it, but this is how George did it. We basically killed a few of these monarchs, um, we cut their wings off, and then we determined the surface area of those wings. So we got the total surface area of the butterfly, and then we had its weight, of course, but for the total surface of the butterfly, we wanted an easier way to do this without killing them. So we then went in, knowing the surface area here, we then went in and we measured the distance with a linear measurement of the left forewing length. 
And then we went in and we formed regression equations with that. So over here is the left forewing length for females and over here is males. And then over here is the surface area of the butterfly. So here's our regression equation where you could basically say, all right, I'm going to go in, I'm going to collect a butterfly, I'm going to scan it like that. I'm going to take this little white point right there and I'm going to measure across here digitally like with Photoshop, get a linear measurement, plug it into my regression equation and it's going to estimate the surface area of that entire butterfly. Then we can release that thing and we're done. Okay, so that's kind of the technique that we developed. What are we doing with this information? Well, here is the wing loads for 2010. So this is the, the, the migration window. So this would be like October and this is November. And this is their wing load. So you'll see here there's a pretty nice steep decline for monarchs that are coming through with respect to their wing loads. They basically come in fairly heavy. By the end of the migration period, those that are still coming in are really pretty light. That could mean that they're, they're not high quality anymore. They may not make it to Mexico. Who knows what it means exactly? But it was interesting. Uh, we followed it up with 2010, and look what happens. 2000, I'm sorry, 2011. That line is not there. They came in uh, as light as they were at the very end of the migration. 2013, we looked at it again. 2014, it didn't ever quite get to this, but it's maybe somewhere in between. So what in the world is going on right there? Well, we started looking at what could cause this. So we looked at 2010. We looked at the drought index for Texas. This is October. This is November of 2010 when, when we had that nice decline in wing load as perhaps is normal. I don't know. Uh, and then 2011, we saw, well, what's the difference between 2010 and 2011? And here's 2011. This was a historic drought. Butterflies were definitely struggling to get through here. And consequently, perhaps this happened. Maybe, right? 2013 um, kind of recovered a little bit, 2014 getting a little bit better. We do have 15 and 16 data, we just haven't quite had a chance to analyze it. Okay, so that's kind of what we've been doing with the monarchs. Finally, um, I want to end here with zebra mussels. Zebra mussels, many of you know, um, are now in Texas and they are actually moving through Texas very quickly. Many never thought zebra mussels would get here. I remember when I was in aquatic biology in 1998, we talked about zebra mussels in, in that class, and uh, there was somewhat of a fear of them getting here, but most people never thought they would because they're native to the Caspian Sea. It's very cold. Um, they can't possibly survive here. Well, they're here. Um, and if you're a boat owner, um, this is what you have to deal with. If you have anything in water that's infested with zebra mussels, this is what happens. That's going to cause mechanical problems, obviously. Water municipalities, they also have to deal with clogged pipes. So these zebra mussels, you'll see here, this is a pipe that used to be a pipe that was pulling water out and the mussels just clog it up to basically prevent any water from getting through it. And so millions and millions of dollars are spent by cities all the time to just clean out these pipes. If you're an organism living in these systems, then this is a native mussel. This is a huge native mussel, but it's colonized with zebra mussels. And those zebra mussels are going to prevent it from basically opening, it can't breathe, and it dies and suffocates. So uh, from a mussel standpoint, crayfish, I don't know if you can see that, but they're covered there in zebra mussels. Um, and then the way that catfish feed, they're also ending up in the GI tracts of catfish, um, which is then obstructing their, their, their uh, digestive system. So it's not good for anyone. Zebra mussels are not good for anyone. They do give us an opportunity to do some research, but they're not good for the systems. Here's where they were in, um, this is actually recent, so this is July of 2017. All the red dots are zebra mussel occurrences. And this graph actually shows the, the zebra mussels that have been eradicated successfully. So I know you're looking for them. It's the square that's purple, and you really got to look here. There's two. There's one there, and there's one there. Okay, so here and here. And the rest are successful. Um, they are hard to get out of the system once they're in. So that's why Parks and Wildlife has really focused on educating the public about not letting them get in to the system to begin with because once they're in, this is not good. Uh, in Texas, this was uh, as of August 17, 2017. Bell County is right here. So that's Belton. That's still House Hollow. Look how many have gone in since then. So almost, almost all the water basins are now um, infested. 
So here we go. Opportunity presents. Let's do some research. Devin uh, Corbett here put in a proposal to Texas Academy of Science, got a grant to study this. Um, subsequently, there were some high school students in Belton that read about it. They wanted to get involved. And I said, hey, we're going to be doing a lot of really intense field work. Yes, please come help. They did. And here's a little another message. Uh, just because you don't want to do a research project on your own, if you just want to help, sometimes that's great because what happened is during the project there was something else that came up and these students took control of that. They ended up presenting it at a conference um, and they're high school students. Now they're off someplace else. But uh, they took advantage of an opportunity. So here's our system. Lake Belton, this is the dam. Um, this is Frank's Marina. So that's our study site at the beginning here. We started there and this was a, a great system. So we had this was the walkway. We literally parked here. We walked onto the marina, walked right over here. That's, where we, that's our sample site. It was great. We could drive our car to the lake, get out, walk into a marina, and do our sampling. Here's Devin uh, taking some, uh, some water quality uh, measurements. And it's a little hard to see, but as the camera moves over here to the right, you'll see some students sitting right there. They're doing some zebra mussel counts. Okay? So what happens here is we drop these chains all the way from the surface to the bottom. We drop three chains every month. We then retrieve those chains every month. And um, Zach's here doing some counts. And then we're, of course, recording that data. Um, and this is what we found. We found that there was a difference in the distribution vertically. So this down here is water depth. So this is the surface of the water up top. And down here is 23 to 24 meters in depth. And so, um, and this is 12 weeks. What we found is you have to have the chains in there about 12 weeks for anything to really happen, for them to colonize and for them to at least get big enough to where we can see them. So for March, the chains that we put in March after three months or after, uh, after 12 weeks, there's really nothing on them. There was a few down at the very bottom. This is the very bottom, by the way, um, because something happened here called a flood. So the water went way up. But this was the bottom at this time. So they were at the bottom. There weren't a few. I mean, this is the key. So there's 18 per square meter there. This is not a lot, just, but they're at the very bottom. Our April chain, after 12 weeks of colonization, look at those numbers. So there was almost 1,500 zebra mussels at that depth of about 11 to 12 meters per square meter. That's a lot. They were almost stacked on top of each other on the chains. And then, for some reason, look what happens for the rest of the month. So this is just the flood. This is why it's so deep here. And then it quickly rebounded and we go back to normal levels. So interesting, something happened here. We don't quite know what, but I took these chains, I took this set of April and I then looked at it. What does it look like over the next subsequent few months? So this was the July measurement. This is what I just showed you. So nothing at the top, nothing much at the bottom, but right in the middle, big cluster here. And then in August, the next month, they were still there although they went up a little bit in their elevation for some reason. But then look at that, nothing. Huge number died off. And so a lot of people are sus suspecting that at subtropical systems like ours, they may get in, but they have a really hard time maintaining their population numbers. We're gonna have a lot, they predict that we have a lot of, of, uh, of crashes, population crashes because of things like t elevated temperature. In this case, I think this is flooding, brings in a lot of nutrients from the watershed, robs the water column of DO, dissolved oxygen, and perhaps causes things like that. And so we were getting this information, this was cool, but, but during this flooding event, here's another opportunity that those high school students jumped in on. During that flooding event, here's my parking lot that I thought was so cool that I could walk onto my marina from. Well, now we're using a canoe to get to the parking lot. Um, and we had to do this for just about three or four months, I think. Um, but we, we did. So there's our flooded parking lot. Uh, the lake came up quite a bit. This is a hydrograph showing us through time. This is water level. So this is feet above sea level. Lake Belton is normally about 594 feet above sea level. That's the normal elevation. Um, this, is, this blue line is the actual elevation at this particular time. So this goes back to 2013, well before we were actually doing this. Our study didn't start till March 16, but this just kind of gives you some historical information about it. But here we had a little bit of a peak and then it goes back down. We hovered above conservation level and then this is the big flood. This is when I was using the canoe to get to the marina. 
So after all of that took place, we thought, well, you know what? We had this really interesting peak right here that was well above the peak from any previous flooding event. What if we went out during that time and we went around the lake and we looked at this particular, I'm sorry, we, we looked at this elevation, so 605 feet above sea level. We went to that elevation and we looked for zebra mussels. All right, they're not in the water anymore because at this point in October when we actually do this, we're, we're back to normal. But what that would do, it was it captured this amount of, of colonization that took place during that flooding, which was about 52 days. So we could look at colonization during that time. We could also look at growth rates to see how they grow here relative to other places. So we did. This is an aerial shot of Lake Belton. You can see these little red circles. These were our sample sites. We just basically went to boat ramps where it was easy access. We went up and uh, there is a measure, there's a, there's a tape measure laying right there, hard to see, but that's at 605 feet above sea level. So that was the point that that uh, amount of water was underwater, that those rocks were underwater for about 52 days. We then randomly selected three of those rocks, they basically look like this, took them back to the lab, started to count. <laughs> and this was tedious. Um, they were dried shells at this point, they were breaking off. Right, things they were coming apart. This was not going to work. We about three hours later, after this first rock of counting this first rock, we decided this is not going to work. <laughs> so we said, well, how can else we do this? We can do, hey, I, I know something about regression equations. Let's do this. Let's take, scrape off all these rocks, um, all these muscles off this rock. Um, let's put them in a little dish. Let's count these, but let's put them in a dish and then weigh them. And that's what Raul is doing here. He's weighing them. We know how many are in these particular cups and we're getting a weight, dry weight. Let's regress that, dry weight down here, number of muscles over here. So let's now we can take a measurement uh, in terms of weight that can then estimate how many muscles there actually are in that sample. And that's the technique that we started to use and it worked pretty well. Well, around the lake, this is what it looked like. If you're familiar with Lake Belton, this is Temple Lake Park. So at Temple Lake Park, during this flooding event for 52 days, there were 2.2 mussels per square centimeter. So the rocks were covered at Lake Belton, especially in the middle portion of the lake. Notice upstream here, there's really nothing up there. And I don't know what that means. Um, it may, may mean that there's just not a lot of boat activity up there. It may mean that the water is flushing things downstream. I just don't quite know, but, but this is the, 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 the area where they were most concentrated. If we look at growth rates during that time, about 138 micrometers per day. Um, if you look here, it's all hovering around that point. And you think, okay, so what? What does that mean? Well, we're just trying to see how does, how does Lake Belton, how does this subtropical reservoir here, which used to be at the southernmost distribution, how does it relate to other areas? What does the growth rate look like here? And so this is from a paper published just this summer. Uh, Churchill works at Lake Texoma. He works on zebra mussels at Lake Texoma, which is on the Oklahoma border with Texas. And he graphed, uh, growth rates, so the same thing we used, uh, the, the shell length, with latitude. So high latitudes up here, these are, this is not just in North America, actually this is in uh, Europe as well, but high latitudes, growth rates were around here, mid latitudes here, subtropical reservoirs, latitudes down there, higher growth rates basically as you go south. Why? Perhaps because of water temperatures are elevated, right? So faster growth cycles. Um, where did Lake Belton, we, we, we figured this in, Lake Belton falls in right there. It's about 31 degrees in latitude, and so we're falling in right along that, that area. Um, I will say that there is a little uh, caveat here, and this paper, the Churchill paper, they looked at it midsummer, ours looked at it early summer, and the difference is, is about three times greater in Lake Belton than it was at that same period of time at Lake Texoma. So our muscles here were growing three times faster at the same period of time than they were just uh, down our I-35. So whatever that mean, I don't know either. But all of these kinds of questions are the things that we typically have been looking at in the lab and students are getting out in the field and these are the kinds of relevant questions that, uh, that we're able to, uh, to answer. So how do you get involved if you're interested as a student? How do you get involved in a research situation? One thing is just to volunteer in a lab. There's all kinds of labs around the area. We've got the VA, we've got Texas A&M Health Science Center here, we've got Scott and White, of course, if you're interested in vertebrates or humans. Um, if you're not, then if you want more of a formal approach to how to do research, I do teach a research methods class. 
and that's where a lot of this information is coming from. And in that class, um, it's really quite different than a typical lecture course. These are the topics that we cover, um, but it's also usually we have two to three students in there. So it's a very small group, um, and we work on how to develop a proposal, how to seek funding for that proposal, and then how to do the research. And we, I have at this point, there are at least three manuscripts that we're trying to work on um, from previous student presentation or pr uh, previous projects. So there is a good chance that it will be successful and worthy of publication because I don't really want to waste time with anything else. We're only going to do things that are meaningful. Um, so if you're interested in the class, uh, come see me because we are offering it in the spring and um, I, I do need to kind of meet with anybody who might be, want, might be interested in taking that. I don't have a specific time or anything like that set up just yet, but if you're interested, come see me. Um, and with that, I am happy to take questions. I know we have just a few minutes if you have any questions. Yes? Was it done successful with the two sites in Havel and Northern Virginia? I don't know. I didn't <laughs> dig into it, honestly. I didn't dig into it. I know Lake Waco uh, for, they were actually physically tried to put a tarp into an entire cove to choke out all the mussels. It was, a, it was really something to see. They had all these boats and they pulled this huge tarp, like what you would see on a football stadium, and it just covered it for like months. Um, it didn't work. So they haven't figured out basically what is making them grow rapidly. Oh, rapid rate growth? I would yeah, probably because, be temperature. I mean, I mean, like taking over. It's temperature. It's got to be temperature, yeah. You see, typically see growth rates increasing with temperature. I know I talked fast. It's hard for me to cut things out, so I just cram it down, and that's how it goes. But um, any other questions? Okay. Well, thank you. If you have any, if you would like to talk about the course, or if you have any other questions, I'm, I'll be up here. So thank you very much.